viewers and uh, especially to Nev Nevendra. He is joining us all the way from uh, Sri Lanka again, uh, a familiar face on the live. And uh, uh, he's a counseling psychologist working in Sri Lanka, and uh, a lot of his experience has been in uh, awareness about suicide prevention, uh, dealing with trauma. Uh, that's something that he works with a lot and uh, he seemed to be one of the apt people to bring on the live for us to discuss this very important uh, topic which is what is it that a suicide gatekeeper can do so we would be uh, talking a lot along those lines um, especially so there have been a lot of uh, incidents also in the recent past of uh, people who have been taking their own lives. So we wanted to bring it out in the open to discuss some of the lesser talked about conversations and some of the myths relating to that and finding out what is it that we, you and I, right? Not just mental health professionals, but just anybody could do to um, help a person in need who is having or experiencing these distressing thoughts. So welcome Nif to the live. Thank you. And um, just to uh, begin, uh, so when we are talking about suicide, not many people would also like to use the word uh, yeah. suicide. There's a lot of fear related to that particular topic. Uh, there's a lot of fear in approaching a person who might be going through these particular thoughts. Uh, more to do with the fact that you may not you may not feel equipped to deal with such a person at that time. Um, and there's a lot of taboo related to that. And yeah. that's something we will be working on. So in this case, suicide is uh, the premeditated taking of one's own life, right? And um, it could a uh, lot of vulnerabilities could present in these individuals. And that is something that we would like to start off with. So uh, Nivendra, if you could just begin talking about, uh, just to give a brief about the topic. Yeah. And um, what is the reason that we are also choosing to do it today? Okay. Thank you. So thank you once again for having me again. I really appreciate it. And this is something I'm very passionate about. So I'm really excited to talk about it today with you and with uh, all our viewers. So uh, you can hear me, right? Yes. Yes. So if we talk about suicide and just look at the context a little bit globally before we talk about other things. So we know roughly for a year, we have about 800,000 people losing their life to suicide according to the World Health Organization, right? Now this 800,000 is just a number and I'm sure uh, passionate about suicide prevention, Mosin, not about suicide. Yeah. So yeah, so the 800,000 is just a figure of of the uh, suicides that are reported, but we know that there are also so many deaths by suicide that go unreported, right? So roughly we can say about 800,000 per year. And so that means it's about one death for every 40 seconds, right? So while we are doing this live, uh, live session, we can kind of imagine, you know, how many people around the world might end up taking their life because if it is one death every 40 seconds, uh, and the other thing that we need to know is that <clears throat> uh, it's the second leading cause of death for young people aged between 15 and 29 years globally, right? Um, so this is a very serious public health problem. It is not a mental health only problem. It's a public health problem, right? Mm -hmm. and it, affects, it affects everyone. I think it affects every one of us in different ways. So we can't say we are, we are not immune. No one is immune to it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, the country I come, for example, come from rather Sri Lanka, we've had a history of having the highest uh, suicide rate in the world in 95, 96. Right? So we had about 47 per 100,000 population at that time, uh, about 15 or more people taking their lives every day. So but we've come down over time because of various interventions, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, okay, so moving on, uh, I think this is something like we are doing today. I think the public needs to address and it's not just only for professionals, right? It is not only for people who, who have a master's or a PhD in psychology or psychiatry or whatever, no, but it's for everybody, yeah. 
So where do you think where do you think we need to start from today? In terms yes. Of, uh, so one of the things is so we were planning to address a couple of the myths along lines of the discussion itself. And the first thing is we want to also talk about the relationship between uh, depression and um, having suicidal thoughts. Okay. So thing, like even when it comes to suicidal thoughts, a lot more people have suicidal thoughts than the ones who actually attempt suicide. Yeah. However, like you mentioned, the um, instances of uh, the attempts also often go unreported. Yeah. Yeah. We, yes. So it's not uh, brought to light there. So if you can just first talk about the relationship between depression and uh, suicidal ideation. Okay. Okay. So I think uh, we discussed depression in the last live we did. Yeah. And, uh, so. Okay, again, just to just to give you a brief context, depression is a illness. It is not something that is just something you and I feel on a day to day basis, but it's something that we diagnose after we've kind of ex experienced certain symptoms for a period of time, right? I'm not going to go over the symptoms today because uh, to, uh, in the interest of time. So the relationship between depression and suicide is that most of the time when someone experiences moderate to severe depression, right? Mm -hmm. uh, at least in my experience, uh, you sometimes find people having thoughts about not necessarily always having the intention to end their life, but they might have thoughts about what it would be like if they were not alive anymore, right? Or what it would mm -hmm. be like if death was... So what I've noticed is that sometimes, Rachel, people who have suicidal thoughts when they're depressed, it also tends to bring them some sort of relief, right? When they're mm -hmm. having those thoughts, because it can feel really heavy and uh, really kind of, you know, you don't have any energy and it's always very kind of negative, dark mm -hmm. thoughts a person might have. So some of those thoughts that a person might have about suicide can actually bring them this sense of relief because it's a, at least a temporary source of escape in their mind mm -hmm. to think about suicidal thoughts, right? Mm -hmm. But but I have to tell uh, all our viewers today that it, that doesn't mean that they'll always act on those thoughts, right? Mm. Even though there's a risk, it's not always true that they will act on those thoughts. But it's normal to have thoughts if if someone is experiencing depression or any mm. other mental illness for that matter, not just depression. Yeah. We have to talk about other mental health issues as well. And also other life events, you know, like significant mm. life changes that can happen that can cause mm. someone to... Feels suicide. I think that's also one of the myths, like you rightfully said, that uh, a person who experiences suicidal thoughts must have a mental health yeah. uh, concern, right? So it's it works both ways that not everybody who has a mental health concern mm -hmm. would have a uh, suicidal ideation. Oh. At the same time, those who have suicidal ideations or who um, attempt to take their own lives also do not necessarily may not necessarily have a mental health concern yes. that's a myth that uh, we often uh, that we, we come across because if a person has uh, attempted to take their own lives or has taken their own life we jump to the conclusion that it has to be depression and nothing yeah, else exactly. Exactly. right so that is definitely a myth and I think also when it comes to depression and the suicidal ideations, one of the strong indicators also is that feeling of helplessness about their state, right? Where they yeah. feel that nothing can help the situation where they are in and that they have no hope at all in the future, right? Those are very two, uh, you know, strong indicators yeah. of depression itself. Yeah. And that also uh, kind of characterizes what these suicidal ideations mm -hmm. would be. So if you, uh, so you mentioned that, uh, that, that there is also a, a, a certain seg segment of people who tend to be more vulnerable yeah. towards uh, having these uh, suicidal ideations. Um, uh, could you just talk a little more about the populations where there's, this is an increased vulnerability? Yeah. I think uh, before I get there, I just want to touch on a few other myths because I think it's important yeah. for people to really understand that. So... One of the other very prominent myths that often prevent us from uh, intervening if someone is 
if we believe someone is at risk of uh, suicide is that we believe that if we talk about it then uh, they might get ideas that they don't already have or they might attempt uh, suicide mm-hmm. if we ask them the question or if we talk about it so we believe that talking about it is a bad idea and we shouldn't talk about it because then it makes it kind of real right but i want to say that talking about it does not increase the risk of someone attempting suicide research has shown this it's not something i'm saying research has shown this and and a lot of research studies that have done been done in the uk and other countries uh, have shown that talking about it does not increase the risk but it actually gives a person an opening or gives a person permission to start talking about how they feel with someone right uh yeah. it, and it removes the stigma and the taboo attached to it when we directly ask someone if they are mm-hmm. experiencing thoughts about suicide so i want to tell the viewers today please uh if you have that misconception in your head please try to work on that because i think the more we talk about it and ask people in a sensitive way uh the more we can help people mm-hmm. right and the other thing is uh a lot of people believe that if a person has attempted suicide before and it has been non fatal uh they believe that they won't attempt again right mm-hmm. because we believe they've learned their lesson or if they survive then they won't do it again because of all the shame and etc etc but mm-hmm. uh i want to say that the risk is greater if someone has attempted suicide once that they'll attempt again so mm-hmm. we have to be extra cautious at that time right and the final thing is a lot of people believe that people who are suicidal want to die right mm-hmm. uh but i want to say that that is most often not the case right yeah. it's just that they don't want to live the life they have anymore because it might be too painful for them or it might be too mm-hmm. distressing but we need to understand that it's not about being selfish or it's not about wanting to die or it's not about being self-centered that they only think of themselves because those are mm-hmm. some very uh very kind of harmful misconceptions that we have in society right mm-hmm. that also tends to affect people who are left behind if someone does take their life because yeah. we tend to be keyboard heroes and warriors and say oh my god he was such a coward he was he was so selfish why didn't he think about his family right but i i want to say that it is not about that most often the mm-hmm. people who who are tested or people who think about suicide the first thing that comes into their mind is family and is people they love is one of those protective factors holds people back from yes. attempting so just have to think about that in that sense so okay you asked me about vulnerabilities and people who might be oh, more yeah. no at risk so, i think this one more thing also which just uh, yeah. came to my net is that um another myth where people believe that um suicide is something which is thought of and attempted uh without a warning that it is an act yes. of it's an impulsive act right but as just by the very definition of it from you know not only studies but of working with these individuals it's it's shown that there are definite warning signs right and that's one of the reasons we also decided to do the sessions that there are certain things that you can watch out for there are yeah. definitely warning signs and suicide as of such is a premeditated it's premeditated which most means often, they would have yeah, thought a couple of times before which relates to one of the other myths that we spoke about that just talking about it to a person or asking a person that particular question sensitively would not put that idea into their head they would have either thought about it or not so you're not the yeah. going to be the person who puts that thought into their head so we should just step away from the fear that we have yeah. about addressing this issue or even if we have the fear it's important we find someone who can intervene who does not have that fear because fear or denial or walking away from a person who has these thoughts is almost like giving them permission to carry on with the act or to or that we don't care or that yeah. we just think that it's not important enough right so yes uh, the uh, uh, about the vulnerable populations so i want to kind of divide this into four segments when we talk about vulnerable uh, kind of looking at mm-hmm. what puts people at risk right so first we'll talk about individual factors that put someone at risk and then we'll move on to talk about relationship factors right mm-hmm. relationship risk factors that might make people vulnerable and then we'll look at a broader sense of community and kind of a more systemic approach to what puts people at risk right so if you look at individual risk factors i think 
one of the first thing is if there has been an attempt, like I said before, uh, then there's always a risk of someone attempting again. So that's one thing that makes someone vulnerable. Uh, if there has been recent personal loss, right, or financial loss, and we've seen that a lot because of the COVID-19 crisis, right, where people have had a sense of losing a lot during this time, and that has led some people to uh, have thoughts about suicide during lockdown, right, in most countries, not just in our part of the world, but in most parts of the world, right. Uh, and another thing that makes people vulnerable is if there has been a very significant life change recently, like a divorce or an unemployment being laid off uh, or, you know, a bereavement of some sort, right, mm -hmm. or a relationship breakdown, right. Uh, the other thing I think is a very, very significant and serious risk factor, Rachel, is chronic pain, right? Mm -hmm. So chronic pain due to physiological illness, it can be because mm -hmm. of kidney issues, because of diabetes, because of cancer uh, and other illnesses that cause chronic pain. And I think globally, that is a very, very uh, important risk factor to consider, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and along with that, people who have uh, incurable illnesses, terminal illness, if you want to call it, right? So that also can put someone at risk. And now, uh, another interesting point is there are certain high-risk occupations, high-risk mm -hmm. jobs that uh, put people more at risk than other people. So normally what mm -hmm. I like to do is I like to get our audience to guess what some of those uh, occupations are. But uh, maybe if we can ask people uh, on the live, if you are able to type it in, what do you think are some high-risk uh, jobs that put people at risk? Do some people just want to type in some of their guesses? Anyone? So I think while, <laughs> while we're waiting for that, um, I think even um, substance use, right? Yeah, so when the, uh, substance use can be an independent factor where, um, uh, which actually during that time, uh, their judgment is impaired, right? Uh, yeah. So judgment can be impaired uh, where there is uh, a lot of substance use. And during that time, uh, this particular uh, act can be something that they would not think out properly. Yeah. And uh, we've had um, manual Farming. laborers, yeah. people no, who are in yes, high stress jobs, mainly where you're constantly uh probably judged by external expectations yeah, right so one uh, thing is also i think um that a lot of times people see that suicide is something that you know um this attempt to take one's own life is seen as a solution to an external problem that yeah. is how people uh process it the ones who are going through the suicidal ideation that it is a solution to an external problem rarely do they perceive it as something uh, internal, right? Uh, which yeah. other sectors? Also, yeah, I was going to say that it's not just about these kind of occupations being high stress, mm -hmm. but jobs mm -hmm. like farming and nursing, medicine, uh, people who work in, in the pharmaceutical industry, mm -hmm. uh, people in the military, right? Uh, we say that those are high risk occupations because they have easy access to means. They have easy yes. access to means that they require to maybe attempt suicide, right? Mm -hmm. So we see now if you look at the medical field, uh, it's ironic that sometimes it's it's people working in mental health, especially in psychiatry, that they might have the highest number of uh, the rate in the medical field mm -hmm. when it comes to suicide. Uh, we know that veterinary surgeons have a high rate of suicide around the world. Uh, and recently in Sri Lanka, we've had also some medical professionals take their life because of various reasons but the factor here is that they have very easy access and also extremely in-depth knowledge about what methods to use and how to use them so we need to be really mindful and uh, take lots of precautions if we know people who are in these uh, professions who might be at risk right um yeah, so you talked about substance abuse. I think that's also very important yes. along with alcohol, right? Mm -hmm. And alcohol is something because we know that uh, male suicide rates are way higher than uh, female suicide rates around the world. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons for that we know is alcohol, right? Because alcohol mm -hmm. impairs your decision-making function. Mm -hmm. It impairs your rational thinking ability, right? And it also 
intensifies distress that you feel sometimes so that mm-hmm. puts people at risk uh, and i think another factor rachel is uh, sexual assault right uh, yes. adults going through sexual assault and also survivors of child sexual or physical abuse right mm-hmm. uh, can put people at risk yeah. anything else that we missed out on that um, research has also shown that um when there are distressing physical symptoms you know like for example prolonged period of time where they uh, experience sleep difficulties yeah. and night after night that they are not able to sleep and they're just not able to put their finger on whether this can actually even get better now sleep is yeah. something that with without which it can get quite personally very distressing and it can be very heavy the next day for the person yeah. so i'm not yeah. talking about one or two days of having distressed sleep but prolonged periods mm-hmm. of sleeplessness of uh, sleep difficulties it could be yeah. um, interruptions during the night and it uh, that is something which distresses a person additionally so it's not just about the uh, uh, substance use so never i we have spoken about ind- individual factors the relationship factors as well so when we say vulnerability it does not mean that everybody in this sector is vulnerable it's a it's a whole yeah. set of factors as well uh okay. so quickly again because of uh, you know for want lack of time uh, could we just uh, go on to talk about uh, who is a gatekeeper right who is a gatekeeper and what is it that they can do yeah okay uh before i do that i just want to add one more two more things really one thing is that people having difficulties with their gender identity and sexual orientation uh because mainly because of homophobia because of transphobia mm-hmm. coming in from society it can increase the risk we've seen that a lot in the people that i work with and the other thing is if someone is taking psychiatric medication for whatever reason and mm-hmm. if you're suddenly starting or stopping without medical advice right that can sometimes uh, bring about suicidal thoughts for people right mm-hmm. so and and the other important thing is rachel there's this concept called the throw of depression right where okay. when you're severely depressed and you don't have any energy at all during that time and yeah. then someone starts on treatment and they start to get back their energy little by little that is when it's actually very very high risk because they have the energy required to carry out mm-hmm. uh, suicidal yeah. plans if they have any so we need to really be cautious at that time as well when someone is on treatment initially right Yes. Okay, so if we talk about gatekeepers, a gatekeeper is anyone who comes into contact with a large group of people on a day-to-day basis, mm-hmm. right? So it could be a teacher, it could be someone like let's say um in you know like a nurse or it could be uh someone just in the community like a community leader or it could be a religious leader, you know? So it can be anyone who comes into contact with a large group of people. And uh, I think globally gatekeeper training is really being advocated for because one thing is we don't have enough uh, professionals right and the second thing is that i think there's a huge role the public can play in preventing suicide by by just being the gatekeeper so what a gatekeeper ideally does is that they are trained to identify they are to identify uh, signs or warning signs that they might see in people they are trained to ask about suicidal thoughts they are trained to provide basic first aid right or we call it suicide first aid and then mm-hmm. they are trained to refer them uh, to a professional or another service that can be mm-hmm. that can help them so that is initially the function uh, of a world over and so it's not, uh, I mean, uh, yeah. it's not counseling it's not that you it's would be counseling the person or um, engaging in therapy or something long term but it helps you recognize the warning signs right yeah. and to understand how is it that you could intervene and refer right so yeah. it's important yeah. that you at least get to notice these signs because a lot of times like we mentioned suicide is premeditated which means there would be warning signs so it's important that we understand also uh what it is uh yeah. so nif we can just quickly start talking about some of the warning signs itself right just yeah. to give a brief uh overview um as to what some of these so they could be um direct cues itself from the person yeah. where the person says um i want to kill myself 
or uh, I want to take my own life. So these are like yeah. direct cues where they are communicating their intent to you, right? Yeah. There could also be um, indirect cues where uh, they would say, give you statements like, uh, "the you know the world, your life would be better without me," yeah. or um, "you would you would re- you would miss me when I'm gone." So these yeah. are like indirect messages of. Um, putting across their intent to about uh, that they probably are experiencing uh, suicidal ideations. And um, we could also have, um, you know, behavioral cues that you could yeah. watch out for, such as, um, you know, sudden changes in uh, their behavior. This could be their temperament. A, a very quiet person who keeps to themselves could start getting very irritated, very angry, and there's a lot of acting out, or it could be the other way around. So sudden changes in behavior, it could be uh, giving away of prized possessions. Yeah. This could be exactly. making arrangements for their, you know, for their pet to be taken care of by somebody else for a period of time because they have something to take care of, something important to take care of. Um, yeah. And like we've already spoke about situational events, you know, like important transitions losses uh, yeah. for example could be times when this could be triggered right yeah. so we could have direct cues and they could be indirect cues as well uh, behavioral situational cues and none of which should be ignored right uh, yeah. Niv, anything else any other a couple of statements other than that that you could cover yeah sure um, a couple of other things to look out for is uh, some similar symptoms to depression where they lose interest in daily life in pleasurable mm-hmm. activities and sometimes you might see a person who has already attempted so you might see signs of it could be poisoning or it could be bleeding or it could be loss of consciousness so at that time it's not about talking to someone but it's about calling 108 and getting them to hospital right mm-hmm. in india so so it's really important to have that knowledge as well uh, alcohol misuse of alcohol so someone who wasn't using alcohol or other substances mm-hmm. currently starting to use a lot right uh, yeah. and a lot of people start to give away their possessions so give away things that they like and they own to other people mm-hmm. right uh, and some people start and it could be i think another important thing is Rachel uh, posts on social media which we often tend to miss because we believe that they are just asking for attention right so then we tend to ignore them but that is a very, very specific point that some people would very openly say it on social media on as their status. So, yes. for example, uh, during lockdown, uh, in the night one day, I saw someone I know in the medical field uh, had put up a status saying goodbye all, right? And for anyone mm-hmm. looking at that, it was like, okay, what is he trying to say? But yeah. because, I don't know, because I was just sensitive to those things, I reached out to him. And it did appear mm-hmm. that he was uh, thinking about suicide that night, right? Mm-hmm. And and then we were able to intervene and help him. So why I said that was we really need to be watchful for things people put up on social media, uh, right? And also mm-hmm. um, kind of other things to look out for is that they might, their personal hygiene might decline, right? They might mm-hmm. not wash, they might not uh, keep themselves clean. Right. And they might also say things like, uh, there's nothing keeping me here. I'm too tired. What's the point? Right. Everything is really black mm-hmm. and dark. Uh, it's yes. just too much. I don't want to exist anymore. So it's not always that they'll directly tell you I'm feeling suicidal or I want to kill myself, but they'll give you all these different hints mm-hmm. that you need to be watchful for to pick up. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I, I want to sleep and never wake up. Yeah. Exactly. I just want to sleep. Yeah. Yeah, that's something also which is there. So it's more likely that uh, there would be more indirect cues, behavioral, situational cues uh, that you need to keep an eye out for, especially we mentioned what are the vulnerable po- uh, populations. We also spoke about the additional risk factors involved. Um, and it's very important at that point of time when any of these cues are there that you need to break away from the fear that of that S word, you know, of the word suicide, that yeah. of talking about it or of approaching the person. A lot, a lot of times it is your own discomfort that you're projecting on yeah. uh, towards the other person at that time that could actually prevent you from helping this person, right? Of so course. we need to understand that it's not a call out for attention, right? It's not just that they are attention seeking 
or um, uh, that we could just pass off by saying something which is uh, minimalizing what they are feeling right so at that point in time it is it is a it is a kind of a cry for help right they do want uh, somebody to intervene right so that is a cry for help and it's important we recognize these cues so we do want to emphasize a little on uh, the things that you can say and also the things that you definitely should not say right because what you say and uh, the manner in which you say it it's it's very important as to how uh, the person would proceed then yeah. uh, their the first thing is when you're not very comfortable right so if you think that um, when you are in denial when you show that fear the fear often comes off to the other person as denial that you are not validating their experience right so let's say a person comes to you and says um uh, you know i i think it would be better if i'm no longer there a lot of people i mean life would be better for my family if um i am not there at that yeah. point of time if you choose to ignore them or because mm-hmm. you don't know what is it's there to say if you don't talk to them about it indirectly it's perceived as you don't care about what they mentioned or in it could also lead on to permission that see i'm getting nobody does care i've even mm-hmm. said this and still people this person did not care about it right so we we first have to overcome the fear right and it's important we don't say the wrong thing at that yeah. particular instance right so a couple of the things at least that we should not say right we spoke about one which is to say that um uh, this is really silly what do you have to lose your life for or um you you uh, you have all of this and you still complain something like this where you don't validate what they're mm-hmm. feeling mm-hmm. right can actually um uh, uh disrupt this process where you could actually help them is there anything else nif that you could add to what is it that we should not say when a person puts when you recognize a cue or if a person communicates an intent to you yeah uh yeah i think a few other things is like you know don't be silly um uh, don't be selfish uh why are you doing this you don't you know that there are so many people who love you right uh what would people feel if you were to take your life right why are you why are you doing that um and then you know it's only weak people who think about suicide come on be strong right be strong you you got this snap out of it what is there to be sad about so i think a lot of those things can be very invalidating for people and i think rachel it's not just about words but it's also yeah. about our expressions our gestures when we talk to someone mm-hmm. because even in our just in how we how we like for example use our eyes right we'll be like oh my god really like that type of a, that is enough for someone to feel invalidated you don't have to say anything all the time right so uh, we i think it's really important to take all talk of suicide very mm-hmm. seriously right be it on social media be it if someone is even joking about it a friend who's just laughingly or if someone posts something on your whatsapp group right uh, a picture or something that makes your alarm bell start ringing i would ask you please to not ignore it don't dismiss it but take it seriously and reach out to that person you might be wrong that person even might not be thinking about it at that time but i think it's always better to reach out rather than to not right because yeah. at least then the person knows that you really do genuinely care about mm-hmm. that person yeah so asking the right question as well to them if you yeah. see any of these cues uh, again not not focusing on your fear of this whole topic but to approach them with the question so a lot of people are still not comfortable saying the word suicide to ask them is this something that you're contemplating right even that there is a way to put it across in a uh, if you for example if you ask tell the person you're not thinking of suicide are you is the wrong way to go about it right because we are telling them we hope you're not thinking about it yeah so that's 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 like cutting down on the chance to actually communicate that intent to you so yeah. rather uh, a better framed question would be i know you're going through a difficult time is this something that has been crossing your mind yeah so that asking them directly right would um, actually increase the chance of them opening out to you and when they do 
it's important not to give advice there we all get into this advice giving mode uh, a couple of things which uh, navendra also mentioned which is you know uh, things would get better sleep on it snap out of it uh, you're much better off than a lot of other people only yeah. weak people think about it so this again indirectly communicates to them that they are weak right yeah. they already feel so so it's very important at that point of time not to go and add to that negative feeling right um and uh, say something instead where they would open out to you right i'm here if you want to talk about it let's talk about it right and listen listening is something i think that's the best thing that you can do which doesn't require a lot of training right it just requires you to keep mum at that moment and listen without passing any judgment like yeah. saying that there is a judgment saying that they're silly is a judgment or that uh, they should think about their family because how selfish they, they can be is a judgment right so we don't understand by being a uh, crude rude abrupt that we are actually passing off those judgments to people who already feel judged by life by themselves by the people that they love uh, around them so it's important we don't add to that uh, state of negativity right so um nif what is it instead that we can say can we focus on the things that we can communicate to them sure so i think as a gatekeeper there are a couple of things that uh, we need to keep in mind when we are talking to someone who might be experiencing suicidal thoughts and like rachel said earlier it's important to ask the question directly the more we ask directly the directly they'll answer you right but if we beat around the bush uh, then you limit the chances of them also opening up so approaching it in a compassionate way, way where you engage them in a very serious conversation so it's not that you're joking about it or you're not showing your discomfort by laughing about it or joking about it but you're being serious because they deserve that seriousness and respect when you talk to them right and you start off with asking something like you know i've been noticing that you've not been looking so well recently or i noticed that you're not yourself as of late is everything okay right and you start the conversation there you don't just jump in and ask directly are you having thoughts about suicide right uh, and then as the conversation goes on you can approach that conversation in a very compassionate way you can say now let's imagine you have a friend who has had a relationship breakdown recently so while talking about that you can very compassionately ask uh, you know when sometimes people go through a breakup they can have thoughts about wanting to end their life because it's mm-hmm. really painful i just want to check in and ask whether you have had any of these thoughts recently right mm-hmm. so that's just a very compassionate way to, in asking that question and if they mm-hmm. say yes to that then you can directly ask the question are you thinking about suicide or are you having thoughts about suicide and when if they say yes and that is when we need to think about what to say right so one thing is one thing one thing i often ask not just my clients but also friends is that Uh, have you thought about a plan because we need to also know kind of understand where the risk lies right so have you thought about a plan or have you thought of a way that you might want to end your life if they say yes and that also gives them a space a open space to start talking right to tell you mm-hmm. and they know that you're not afraid to hear those things so the more yeah. you op- show that you're open they are also willing to be open with you so you can say things like you know it is not a terrible thing to have thoughts about suicide at a time like this with what you are going through okay yeah. some people have it because it's just really painful and it's normal so to really validate it by validating yeah. you're not agreeing saying that it's the right thing to do but you're validating their feelings right mm-hmm. that's very important and mm-hmm. then to say things like okay i'm here i'm i'm going to support you through this and even if that person wants to sit completely silent and not talk you can just say something like okay i understand that it can be difficult for you right now to talk but i'll sit with you right i'll just yeah. be here with you in silence because one of the key principles is rachel that we don't leave a person who is at risk alone we never do that right we somehow make sure that there is someone with them and right? on them yes yeah so that is important you want to just sit silently with that person next to mm-hmm. the person uh and you ask specific questions like okay can i help you with something or can i help you call a friend can i help you call someone you need to or can mm-hmm. i help you get to let's say to talk to a mental health professional 
right? Yeah. Or if you have a like in Sri Lanka, we have a couple of helplines. So I would say, okay, here's a number that you can call. It's anonymous. You can call and talk to someone because you might, you know. So things like that can be really helpful. And to say, and also after your initial conversation, to check in with the person regularly. It can be just a text, right? And sending a really caring message out, saying, mm -hmm. you know, okay, I'm here. I care about you, and I want to know how you're doing. So, mm -hmm. and sometimes they might say, I don't want to talk right now. And, and it's important to not take it personally, but to try again in a little while. So, but you know, sometimes we have to be a little persevering when we are talking to people yes. who might So that be, persistence uh, actually is yeah. what uh, we also want to emphasize on that the first time the person backs off and says, no, I don't yeah. want to talk about it. Doesn't mean that uh, that gives you, uh, that, that tells you that, okay, I, I have to leave them alone, right? Yeah. Understand that, because of what they're going through, they already feel um, probably even guilty about having these thoughts. They mm. may not, they might, find, they might feel um, it difficult to talk about something that is highly judged by the society. Yeah. To someone, it's very difficult to express these emotions. So at that point, patience as well as perseverance or persistence is important. Saying that I'll sit here and I'll wait with you or... Yeah. Um, it's okay if you're not ready to talk about it right now, but I will be there when you are ready to talk about it. And yeah. something which uh, Navendra mentioned also that if the person says that, yes, they have thought about it. Yes, they are thinking about it. Um, and if you're not comfortable asking about their plan, for example, but you understand that there have been warning signs, mm -hmm. you have asked them about it and they say yes. Right. So at that point of time, you can bring in what we call as the referral process. Right. It's where you direct them to someone. It's important to um, have these helpline uh, numbers ready. You could have an em emergency service number of the nearest hospital, which is uh, ready. Um, uh, uh, at, at times, even when uh, they refuse to get help, for example. Right. Uh, it's. It's that every person needs to be given an opportunity for that help, right? So we, especially when there is a risk for suicide, inpatient admission also Sometimes, is, yeah. is mandated. Yes, so that is a possibility as well. So have all the data with you. In fact, um, there's an increased chance that they would actually get help when you assist them in the process, right? Actually get them the data or go yeah. with them to get help, even dial the number for them to get help whenever they yeah. are ready. But yeah. let them talk, right? Let them talk. And it's important you ask that question when you see uh, the warning signs, right? So at this Rachel, point... Uh, one more yeah. thing. Now, let's imagine you tell me, I ask you and you tell me, uh, yes, I have been thinking about suicide or mm -hmm. I've been thinking about and I tell you and you tell and then uh, you tell me. Um, but Nivendra, please don't tell anyone. Okay. It's complete. I just want you to keep it confidential. You can't tell anyone about this. Please promise me that you won't tell anyone. What do you think is appropriate response there? So the idea is that we, we don't promise. We never promise to keep things confidential. If someone tells you about uh, suicide, right? It's very yes. important because that can be really difficult for you if you have to tell someone else because the person is at imminent uh, risk. Mm -hmm. So never ever promise confidentiality, even if it's a friend or even if it's someone else, please uh, always say that I might have to uh, get you help. So then I would have to tell someone. It's also really important. And mm -hmm. people might worry if I say that, would they trust me? Right. But we have to find a way to sort of let them know that we can't promise uh, secrecy at that time. It's very important. Yes. So, um, so this is just uh, for all of you to get an overview or to get an understanding about what a gatekeeper does. Okay, so it's about understanding these warning signs and about uh, knowing the about the right question to ask and about not saying um, the wrong thing, uh, but to listen to them patiently, without any judgment, and uh, understanding also what is the process of uh, referrals, uh, having those helpline uh, numbers uh, ready and uh, to probably assist them in the process rather than just directing them to just go ahead with it. Um, yeah. Right. I think Niv, we lost you for a bit, but as long as you can hear me. I can hear you. Yeah. yeah. 
all right um to assist them in the process right to go with them in fact um uh, the by asking the question itself research has shown that uh, you reduce the chance that they are likely to proceed with the attempt by yeah. asking them that right so it's not that it's never to back off thinking that uh, by suggest i'm suggesting it to them they are already going through a difficult phase i'm the one putting in that idea that is mm-hmm. a myth if a person mm-hmm. is having these ideations they would have already thought about it so it's premeditated right they would have had these thoughts um uh and probably having a difficult time uh, uh experiencing this it's something very difficult to go through i'm pretty sure um uh, at least maybe 50% of our viewers easily would have um had this experience of having a thought themselves or know somebody mm-hmm. uh who have had or experienced these thoughts so it's important for us to be prepared rather than to fear talking about this or to use that uh, much tabooed word and uh, there are different different courses which you can take as uh, people you don't need to be a mental health professional to take these courses there are several courses that you could take to uh, prepare yourself how to understand the quest uh, to uh, intervene in fact i think with knowledge about this concern itself comes better preparedness and that's important right so yeah. the fear only comes when you deal with the unknown but if it's the known yeah. you are better prepared and you can definitely give them some hope there by intervening and by asking the right question and by having the referral mediums ready uh, mm. so nif thank you uh, so much if there's anything like an additional take away that you would like to give us before we uh, yeah. wind up yeah i think i just have something that i teach a lot of uh, you know public when i do workshops something that you can use with a friend right it's very very simple very fast i'll just tell you that and then we can so it's called yeah. a hand technique right it's called a hand technique uh, where you use your hand as a way to uh, think about the different support systems that you might have which you can do with a friend or someone else who might be at risk right so your fingers uh, your fingers five fingers represent five people you can talk to or you can reach out to in your life or five places that you can uh, places that you can go to relax right so it could be the park it could be the beach it could be whatever right and it could also include organizations that you can reach out to for support so that's where your referral systems come in so it could be a helpline number or it could be a hospital whatever so just working on this with a friend right saying okay can you think of let's say two or three people you can reach out to a couple of organizations you can reach out to and places you can go to to just relax right the lines on your palm indicate uh, activities they they can engage in to reduce distress to reduce stress levels so it could be exercise it could be listening to music it could be engaging in a hobby it could be just you know meeting someone for coffee whatever so activities they can do to uh, kind of reduce distress uh, you can those are the lines in the palm and then you have some uh, two or three faint lines on your wrist over here and that is uh statements or coping statements that they can tell themselves when they are in distress so something like uh this is going to pass or these thoughts are temporary uh, i have felt this way before and i have dealt with it right or there is hope or i can get through this so things like that you can tell yourself would be the faint lines on your wrist so this is really an easy way to sort of get people to start thinking about uh, support systems and things that resources that they already have rachel because when someone is suicidal one of the first thing that happens is that their uh, th- what we call cognitive constriction starts to happen where they develop tunnel vision so they see only kind of one one particular option but this would help them kind of open that out a little bit so that's what i want to leave uh, people with because that's i found that's- that very helpful that's really very uh, helpful nivendra thank you so much and also to all our viewers for their questions and their interactions um the video will be up shortly for those of you who joined in late uh, it will be up on um, uh, the youtube channel so please do share it uh, so that more people will come to understand that there is definitely something that they can do um by being gatekeepers in the community uh, helping to intervene Uh, uh when someone experiences these distre- distressing thoughts there's mm-hmm. definitely something that you could do um thank you so much nivendra once again thank you thank you for having me thank you all our viewers for joining us thank you
Bye. Bye-bye.